Chapter 8. Thought Transference by Man Under Conditions of Physical Contact Before proceeding to discuss the subject of thought transference by human beings under conditions of physical contact, I wish to say a word in regard to terminology, especially in reference to the distinction that should be observed between the terms. Thought Transference and Telepathy The Century Dictionary treats them as synonyms, and much confusion in the popular mind has resulted. I do not hope, however, to reform this habit in the public mind. I merely wish to say that I shall use the word telepathy strictly as it has been defined by the Society for Psychical Research, namely, to cover all cases of impression received at a distance without the normal operation of the recognized sense organs. Thought transference, on the other hand, will be used to cover such cases of transferred mental impressions as occur at a not appreciable distance as when the agent and the recipient are in personal contact or within touching distance, for example, when passes are made in close proximity to the person of the recipient or subject. The terms agent and recipient are applied in both telepathy and thought transference, the former to the one who sends the message and the latter to the one who receives it. As before stated, when the old mesmeric methods were employed, there was constant, or practically constant, contact between the operator and his subject. The result was that the higher phenomena, for example, thought transference, were as constantly produced. It attracted the attention of the so-called scientists of the day, however, only to be met by wholesale denial and ridicule, and nothing worthy of the name was done by the latter to test the verity of the phenomena. Then, when the method of hypnotism or braidism was found to be a labor-saving process of inducing the sleep, it was largely adopted by mesmerists, the result of which was that the higher phenomena were rarely produced. And in due time thought transference was relegated, in the public mind, to the domain of exploded humbugs, or, at best, the lost arts and science gained a temporary triumph. In the meantime, however, someone invented what is familiarly known as the willing game. There was no claim that there was any mesmerism, hypnotism, or magnetism in it, and so marvelous were some of the results that science consented to become interested in it, notwithstanding the claim that it demonstrated thought transference. Drive W. B. Carpenter, of London, was, I believe, the first to go on record with a description of the phenomena and a so-called scientific explanation. His description follows, several persons being assembled, one of them leaves the room, and during his absence some object is hidden. On the absentee's re-entrance, two persons who know the hiding place stand, one on either side of him, and establish some personal contact with him, one method being to place one finger on the shoulder, while another is for each to place a hand on his body. He walks about the room between the two willers, and generally succeeds before long in finding the hidden object, being led towards it, as careful observation and experiment have fully proved, by the involuntary muscular action of his unconscious guides one or the other of them pressing more heavily when the object is on his side, and the finder as involuntarily turning toward that side. This conclusion was arrived at after a few experiments conducted in such a way as to exclude the possibility of disproving Dr. Carpenter's theory as to his particular experiments, or any other experiments conducted as he states above. There is, indeed, no possible doubt that experiments of that particular kind, and conducted in that particular way, are easily explicable under his hypothesis, for, as Dr. T. A. McGraw, of Detroit, later pointed out, it is practically impossible for human nature to resist the temptation to assist, consciously or unconsciously, in making the experiment a success. This is especially true of parlor entertainments conducted for the mere amusement of the spectators. Be that as it may, Professor Carpenter labeled his explanation muscle reading. And muscle reading it is to this day among those so-called scientists who seek to elevate their ignorance to the dignity of skepticism as to the verity of thought transference or telepathy. Wherever personal contact is not excluded, every possible phase of thought transference is dismissed with the one phrase, muscle reading. And all other phases of the phenomena are systematically denied. Thus, if a psychic correctly names every card in a pack, one after another in rapid succession, it is muscle reading if she holds the hand of the agent. If not, it is trickery and ledger domain. If Mrs. Piper holds the hand of her sitter while she correctly relates the incidents of his past life and tells correctly the names and ages of his family or friends, living or dead, it is muscle reading. 
If she performs the same feat without physical contact with the sitter, it is fraud and collusion. This, with all its monumental absurdity, expressed and implied, is the present attitude of so-called science, or rather, let us say, of some so-called scientists, with reference to thought transference and telepathy. Let us see what it implies. As the great Dr. Carpenter set the pace for that class of scientists, let us re-examine his words and compare them with the conclusions drawn by his followers. It will be observed that he carefully confines himself to one class of cases, namely, those wherein the psychic is required to do something, for example, walk about the room in search of a hidden object. The wilier s place their hands upon his shoulders and accompany him about the room, strongly willing him to find the hidden object. Dr. Carpenter infers that the psychic was led to it by the involuntary muscular action of his unconscious guides, one or the other of them pressing more heavily when the object is on his side and the finder as involuntarily turning toward that side. The theory, in other words, is that the psychic is pushed or pulled in the right direction by muscular action alone, voluntary or involuntary. And who will, or can, deny the justness of this conclusion drawn from the premises as stated by Dr. Carpenter? But does it justify the conclusion that muscular action can be pressed into service to enable a psychic, normal acquisition of knowledge being out of the question, to give correctly names of persons, dates of events, denominations of cards? or to relate an anecdote that is verifiable only by subsequent research. The question answers itself, and yet all this is included in the muscle-reading hypothesis of the so-called science of the day. The Society for Psychical Research felt compelled to pay attention to the hypothesis for the purpose of showing that, whilst Dr. Carpenter's conclusions might be justified in the limited field which he explored, it could not be pressed beyond its boundaries. To that end, its committee cited numerous instances, in contact cases that were clearly inexplicable on the theory of muscle reading. But the efforts of the committee were chiefly directed toward proving that the same things could be done without personal contact. In this, as all the world knows, except the class of scientists named, they succeeded so far as to demonstrate telepathy beyond a peradventure. Unfortunately for my present purpose, I am not in a position to avail myself of their labors. It would be a work of supererogation at this late day to undertake to demonstrate to readers of this book the verity of telepathy as a faculty of the human mind. Telepathy will, therefore, be taken for granted. What I wish to show is that thought transference is greatly facilitated by personal contact, and as the labors of the Society for Psychical Research were not directed to that object, the illustrative incidents are not so plentiful as could be desired. Nevertheless, I hope to make up for it by appealing to the experience of everyone who has taken an intelligent interest in psychical research. I will cite one case, however, which will serve to illustrate my meaning. It is found on page 55 of Volume 1 of the Proceedings of the Society. It is stated as follows. My daughter, who had recently returned from a visit to her brother at his vicarage, asked M. B., who was again seated with eyes bandaged and pencil in hand, who preached at my brother's church last Sunday evening. The answer to the question being known to my daughter only, M. B. wrote the first six letters of the name, Vis, Westmo, and then said, I feel no more influence. My daughter said, Lean your head against me. M. B. did so, and then wrote the rest of the name, making it quite right, Westmore. It is clear that Dr. Carpenter would not have regarded the first part of this answer as coming within his muscle-reading hypothesis, for there was no contact whatever. And it would require the united efforts of a large number of his most devoted followers to believe that a momentary contact of the head of the psychic with the clothing of the wilier would enable her to complete the word by muscle-reading, as Dr. Carpenter defined it. In other words, it would require a large amount of scientific credulity to believe that this momentary contact could convey from one to the other the remaining letters of the name by unconscious muscular action on the part of one person, and automatically interpreted by the other. In strict justice, however, to those scientists who find a universal solvent for all contact cases in muscle reading, it must be stated that the above-named society set the pace at the beginning of its labors by agreeing to relegate indiscriminately all contact cases to the domain of muscle reading. It is needless to say that adherence to this rule has led the society and its followers into innumerable absurdities and greatly retarded its own progress in the investigation of some important phases of psychic phenomena.
for example. Mesmerism. It was a tub thrown to the scientific whale, albeit it will yet be found that the tub, thus recklessly thrown away, was one of its most valuable assets. For if it is true that thought transference is facilitated to an appreciable extent by psychical contact between agent and percipient, it is a fact in nature that science cannot safely ignore. Necessarily such a fact is invested with profound significance, and the Society for Psychical Research, when it assumed to ignore it in deference to an insensate prejudice born of profound ignorance, wronged itself and indefinitely retarded the progress of the investigation it was organized to prosecute. It is an axiom of science that no fact or phenomenon, however insignificant it may seem to be, can safely be disregarded in an inductive investigation of the problems of nature. For it often happens that a phenomenon which in itself is apparently destitute of scientific significance furnishes a solvent for the most important problems when considered in its relations to other phenomena. It would not be difficult to show that the society has seriously handicapped itself by ignoring phenomena that afford a complete and valid explanation of many important psychological problems. That, however, is a question of no practical importance to us in this inquiry although the points wherein it failed will appear incidentally as we proceed. The question with which we are now concerned is, does physical contact between agent and percipient facilitate thought transference? In presenting the evidence on this point, I can safely appeal to the observation and experience of thousands who have come in contact with so-called spirit mediums. Anyone who has attended an old-fashioned spiritistic seance will recall the fact that physical contact between members of the circle was considered an essential prerequisite to success in obtaining phenomena. Usually the whole company, including the medium, were seated around the table, each member of the circle clasping the hand of his neighbor on either side. Various reasons were given for this practice, but, whatever the reason assigned, each medium considered it an essential condition of success. Hence they were designated as circles, and each member was strictly enjoined not to break the continuity of the circle. The fact that this condition was, for some reason, essential to success was demonstrated by the phenomena. Thus, as long as the circle remained unbroken, a good medium would have at her command the thoughts of all present. But the moment that the contact was broken anywhere in the circle the medium would immediately become aware of the fact and complain of inharmonious conditions. Many mediums were able to locate the exact point where contact was broken. Others could locate a skeptic anywhere in the circle, and some would be unable to proceed until the offending member was ousted from the circle. Spiritists, of course, will say that these phenomena had nothing whatever to do with thought transference between living persons, and that it was all due to the limitations of spiritual intercourse. This question need not be argued in this connection for such phenomena do not stand alone as evidence of the point we wish to make. The same phenomena occur in experimental thought transference where physical conditions are the same. That is to say, thought transference is almost invariably facilitated by physical contact between the agent and the percipient. I have made hundreds of experiments with the view of testing this question, while at the same time eliminating the possible element of muscle reading. Thus, I assume that when a telepathist, under test conditions, correctly states the denomination of a card drawn at random from a pack, there is no possible code of signals, consciously or unconsciously employed. That will enable one person to convey to another a statement that the jack of clubs has been drawn from the pack. And when nine-tenths of all the cards in the pack are correctly named in rapid succession, it is safe to assume that muscle reading, in the sense in which Dr. Carpenter employed it, is ridiculously inadequate to explain the phenomena. I have repeatedly made the following experiment. Selecting a company of six or eight persons, I would securely blindfold one of the party to act as the percipient. Then draw a card at random from a pack and place it on a table in full view of everyone, except of course the percipient. Under such circumstances telepathy is comparatively easy, provided the members of the company are earnest and harmonious. But I have invariably noted that where the percipient is new to the experiment, his lucidity is greatly promoted by forming a circle of which he is a part. It is an exceptionally good psychic who can dispense with physical contact in the beginning of his career. The same remarks apply to phenomena other than card reading. I once had the privilege of experimenting with one of the best telepathists in the United States. She could read in rapid succession a whole pack of cards without an error. 
During the course of my experiments, I was induced to commit the unpardonable folly of trying to convince a so-called scientist of the fact that telepathy was a power of the human mind. In making the experiment, I caused him to purchase a new pack of cards from a neighboring store to shuffle them himself behind the back of the psychic, who was also blindfolded to the entire satisfaction of the scientist. In pursuance of instructions, he drew a card from the center of the pack and exhibited it to me. The lady was somewhat embarrassed at first and hesitated somewhat in naming the card. Finally, she asked me to take hold of her hand, whereupon she instantly named the card. This V slash has repeated in rapid succession until the whole pack was exhausted. This feat having been performed without an error, the scientist was asked to express an opinion. This he did with great promptitude and alacrity by informing me that it was all muscle reading. Neither myself nor the psychic had anticipated such a reply under the circumstances, whereupon she offered to repeat the experiment without physical contact. The challenge was accepted and the scientist was allowed to prescribe his own conditions. The result was that the lady named more than half of the cards correctly. The falling off was doubtless due to embarrassment and over-anxiety, and partly to the fact that thought transference is facilitated by physical contact. It should be remarked in this connection that these experiments were not made with special reference to testing the question of thought transference by physical contact. I could, however, fill many volumes the size of this with incidents demonstrative of the proposition that physical contact does facilitate thought transference in cases where muscle reading is simply out of the question. It remains to inquire what is the physical mechanism that enables this to be done. The answer is not far to seek, and the reader has already anticipated me when I say that the nervous organism of man appears to be specially designed for that purpose. Everybody knows that the nerves have their terminals in the cuticle, that the terminal nerve cells are more highly differentiated than almost any others, especially those located in the tips of the fingers. They are differentiated with special reference to the conveyance and reception of intelligence. The result is that when contact is made with another by the laying on of hands, a chain of communication is established between the subjective minds of the two individuals. It follows that physical contact by laying on of hands brings each and every cell of the bodies of both the agent and the percipient into potential rapport, and that this rapport may be made actual by a proper mental effort. It will now be seen that man is endowed with the requisite mechanism for mental healing by means of physical contact.